This video is for section 9.2, test for population proportion, and this is our first experience with doing a hypothesis test from beginning to end. This video will have two parts. I'm going to walk you through the conditions and the format of a hypothesis test, and then we'll do one problem, state plan do conclude from beginning to end. So take a look at the problem we have here. So we have a potato chip manufacturer. Uh, they just received a truckload of potatoes, and if they determine that more than 8% of the potatoes have blemishes, then the, trunk, uh, the truck will be sent back. Now we certainly can't check every single potato. Uh, that would take a long time and be uh, quite uh, grueling. So instead we're going to take a random sample of 500 potatoes from the truck and that inspection revealed that 47 of the potatoes had blemishes. So here we're going to do a significance test at the 10% significance level. That was a predetermined level that would be determined by the people doing the test. And what should the producer conclude? So that's our context for today. So let's walk through everything we have to do in order to do this test. We're going to do a one sample Z test for population uh, proportion. And the first thing we have to look at are the conditions. Now the good news here is since we just did confidence intervals, uh, the conditions for these tests are not all that dissimilar from what we were doing for uh, uh, confidence intervals. So let's take a look at those conditions. First of all, we need a random sample. Whoops. Need a random sample taken from the population of interest. We're going to have to check that. Probably the toughest part uh, for us and the part that gets confusing is the normal sampling distribution here. In this case, we need n p sub zero. Now p sub zero in the potato chip problem, that's 8%. It's the hypothesized uh, proportion. Uh, the proportion we believe is true. Um, so those both, the, both have to be greater than 10. Um, and that's the expected number of successes and failures. We'll see that in practice when we do the state plan to conclude. And we also need independent observations. And just like before, if we draw uh, from a large population, uh, the, the population being greater than 10 times the sample, then we can safely assume independence. So not all that different than what we were doing with confidence intervals. Okay? After we have everything, we're going to do something new. We're going to compute something called the test statistic. And what the test statistic does is it measures how far our sample is from what we would expect to happen if the null hypothesis is true. Again, we always know there's going to be variability in samples. We'll rarely get exactly what's hypothesized, but how unusual is our sample? This is not going to look all that different um, than what we did with z-score. Um, so here come the formulas here. I'll just shine them up here, and then we'll take a look at them. Uh, the test statistic is some statistic minus a parameter divided by the standard deviation of a statistic. And if you think back to what we did with normal distributions, this is not all that different than a z-score. Uh, statistic back in chapter 2 meant we had some x, we subtracted it from some mean, and we divided it by the standard deviation. Well, we're going to do the same thing here, except now we have the language of proportions. We're going to take our p-hat, subtract it from the hypothesized proportion, and divide by the standard deviation. And then we will then compare that um, using our normal curves um, to what we would expect to have occur here. Okay. After we have our test statistic, we'll be able to find a probability using norm CDF or our normal tables, and we'll write a conclusion based on it. So there's also some writing that has to occur here. So when we write conclusions, there are two things that we have to take care of. First of all, we have to clearly compare our computed p-value to the chosen alpha, which is 10% in this case. Uh, we'll use this comparison to either reject or fail to reject a null hypothesis. So the first sentence will be ver fairly statistical and technical. But the second sentence has to talk about the context. We want to interpret our results in the context of the problem and generalize to the population of interest. So when we're done, we want to be able to say something about this truckload of potatoes. Either we believe that they are greater than 8% with blemishes or that we don't have evidence that they're greater than 8%. So again, one technical looking sentence and then one sentence that interprets the results dealing with potatoes. Okay. That's about it. Doesn't look all that different from confidence intervals. Some new ideas in there. So now it's time for us to talk about potatoes and do a state plan do conclude using our potato problem. So we're going to go through the four steps here. Okay. First step is our state. So we want to determine if a shipment of potatoes should be sent away. We'll do a, a hypothesis test at the alpha equals 10% level. We have a null and an alternate hypothesis here. Our null hypothesis is that the proportion of potatoes is 8%. Our suspicion might be that it's actually greater than 8%, or this is what we're trying to prove. And since P is being used here as a parameter in the problem, we have to very carefully and specifically define what P stands for. P is the actual proportion of potatoes in the shipment with blemishes. One small thing here, um, I was unable to get the little alpha symbol here. So I just wrote alpha. You're going to want to write that symbol in there. Okay, So make sure you write the little alpha symbol 
uh, looks like the little Jesus fish uh, in there. Okay, so there's our state. The plan is not all that different than what we did with confidence intervals. We have to go through three things, uh, randomness, normality, and independence. So our plan. If our conditions are met, we will do a one sample Z test for proportion. Notice how I'm naming the test I'm gonna do here. Uh, that was a stumbling block for some people in the last test. So make sure you name your test. Three things we gotta do. Random, a random sample of potatoes was taken from the population. We do have an SRS, so that condition's met. Normality, if P equals, uh oh, if P equals 0.08, this is supposed to be, make sure you write that in your notes correctly, not 0 0.8, 0 0.08. If the true proportion of potatoes is 0 0.08, then we should expect to see 500 times 0 0.08 blemished and 500 times 0 0.92 unblemished. And notice I didn't actually calculate these two numbers. Uh, you can if you want to, but since it's clear that both of those is greater than 10, the normality condition is met. If you're not sure if they're greater than 10, you might want to calculate them. Here I did not calculate them because I'm, I'm confident that both of those are greater than 10. In fact, you would get here, what, a 40 and a 460. So normality condition is met. And independence. It seems reasonable to assume that there are more than 5,000 potatoes in the truck. That's 10 times uh, the sample size, so the condition is met. We can assume that uh, we have independence uh, within our sampling procedure. Okay, so there's the plan. The do part. The do part is the calculation. Let me just bring the whole thing up here and I'll walk you through it. So the do is all the calculation stuff. The sample proportion of unblemished potatoes, that's a p hat. That's 0.094. So keep in mind what we have going on here. Uh, it's supposed to be that the truck has 8% of blemished potatoes. Um, we got a sample that's 9.4%. Is that all that unusual? Certainly 9.4% is more than 8%, but is it an unusual amount more than 8%? Well, to find out, we're going to compute our test statistic. And this is just a calculation now using the form that we have here. We have a P hat of 9.4%, uh, hypothesized P of 8%, we find the standard deviation. Just one little thing about the standard deviation. Notice that 0.08 and 0.92 are the numbers used in the standard deviation. That's because they're the hypothesized value. They're the default value. Uh, we're trying to find the probability of something happening if the null hypothesis is true. Therefore, we're using the null hypothesis values within our calculations. And that comes out as a z-score of 1.15. And you need to ask yourself, is a z-score of 1.15 all that unusual? And I think through your training, you'll agree um, that that's not above two. Z-scores above two are usually where our radar should start going off. So that is not an unusual value, but we can check it using norm CDF. This probability is now called the p-value. The probability that you get a Z that's greater than 1.15 is 0.1251, and a nice little sketch helps um, do things here. So you might wanna pause me and make sure you have this all written down, but a lot of this doesn't look much differently um, than what we did in chapter two with the normal distribution. So notice we're tying together a whole bunch of stuff we've done throughout the course. So we have a p-value of 0.1251, and this is what we need to focus in on because now it's time to write our conclusions. Keep in mind, two sentences in our conclusion, one fairly technical looking sentence, and then one um, that appeals to the population of potatoes. So here's our conclusion. If the true proportion of blemished potatoes is 8%, the probability of getting sample where 9.4% have blemishes is 0.1251. This is greater than our chosen significance level of 10%, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We do not have evidence um, to, uh, to, to accept the alternate hypothesis. We do not have convincing evidence um, that the actual proportion is greater than 8%. Now, this is kind of wordy here. There's a lot of words here and a lot of stuff going on here and a lot of argumentative stuff here. I wanna make sure you understand the full argument. There are times when we'll shorten this up a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about what is the minimum that you need in order to write a conclusion. But for now, I really want you to understand the argument that we wanna compare our null hypothesized value to what we had in the sample and what the probability of that is. Tying that all together in a sentence and then comparing it to an alpha. And now that we have all that, now we need our potato sentence. There is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the shipment contains more than 8% blemish potatoes. The producer will use this truckload to make potato chips, and thank God for that, we can have our potato chips. So state plan do conclude. We're just adding some steps. It adds some spice to it from what we did with confidence intervals. This is our first hypothesis test from beginning to end, and congratulations on that. We did it together.